small crowds don't don't bother me. As missionaries, many years, small crowds, sometimes that's what you had to preach to. And, uh, but, you know, we just got to be faithful in what God's called us to do. And, uh, you know, the word of God says where two or three are gathered in his name, that there is he in the midst. So God is with us today. And God's with those that maybe can't be here today because of uh, COVID or some, or some other thing. So we, we pray that God will be with them where they're at and minister to them as we know that the Lord can. And uh, so I don't know. Am I, am I on, brother? Am I on? Okay. I don't want to have this thing here and not be on, you know. And anyways, uh, I was in Morgantown yesterday. Uh, had a bus trip with the school board. And I went by a church yesterday and something caught my attention there. And um, had the church sign out there that said, uh, talking about the, the church services and had the traditional service and then it had a contemporary service time. And um, I guess that's the way things are headed. But to me, I don't like that because I don't, I don't like, I don't think the church should be divided. And that kind of, to me, this, it's, you know, everything today is geared to divide people, divide our nation, you know. And even, we see it even in the churches now today that things are happening where people, uh, you know, we, things just want to divide people, you know. Okay, oh, I go to the, the traditional service, which I guess would be singing the hymns that we sing. I tell you, I don't know about you, but I love the hymns. And if I, if I couldn't come to church and sing the good old hymns, I, uh, I don't know if I would want to go. Because, you know, I've been saved uh, quite a long time. I got saved, and my wife and I have both in 1979, so that's over, what, 40 years. And when I got saved, I got into the, the Baptist church, and they were singing the old hymns. And I haven't stopped singing the old hymns. And I have no intentions on singing the old hymns. And uh, to be quite frank with you, I don't, I don't like it when, you know, like churches nowadays, you know, with the COVID, they take out the hymn books out of the, out of the pews. I, I, I don't understand that. I don't understand how, you know, you could pick up a hymn book and catch COVID with a hymn book. But you see how, you see, you know, how these things are, are going on, you know. Uh, you know, the devil does, the devil is, he's, He's an enemy of the word of God, and he's, let me tell you something, he's an enemy of the good old hymns. So I guess what I'm saying this morning is, hold on to your hymn book, amen? Hold on to those good old hymns. At the, you know, the old record cross, uh, what, a, what a great song. You know, the old, hymns have, the old hymns have messages. You know, they have a message. And uh, it have a, it's a, a message based on the word of God not based on somebody's uh, imagination. So anyways, uh, it's good to, to be with you this morning. Good to open up the word of God. Um, I, I'm, I, guess, I'm, I guess I'm what you call a Bible believer. Um, I believe the word of God, King James Bible, from cover to cover. I don't think there's any errors in the King James Bible. So you don't have to worry about me correcting it this morning. Um, if anything, God corrects me. Uh, I'm not that smart enough to correct the word of God. And, uh, but I want to talk about something that I, I think is a very um, wonderful topic to, to, to preach on. I want to talk about God's abundant supply. God's abundant supply. You know, God never runs out. God has a supply of things. Things that we need, things that things that men need, and God's supply does not run out. You know, we, you you're not going to go to the store looking for something, and and uh, like you know, you go out looking for, you know, when they remember they had the, to the toilet paper crisis, people were out there buying all kind of toilet paper. You know, you, you had to go to the store and you couldn't find toilet paper because they they ran out of toilet paper or. You know, now they run out of all kinds of things today. 
and uh, some things they just don't want to they they don't want to supply. Um, I was on uh, I went on the Cabela's website recently looking for you know, I want to buy some ammunition, you know, for for deer hunting, you know, and I went to look on ammunition and I have a thirty odd six that I want to buy some some ammunition for, and I went on uh, and went on site there looking for some ammunition and. Every time I clicked on like a different thing, it said out of stock, out of stock, out of stock. This, now, this is Cabela's. This is supposed, supposed to be like the, the premier outdoor supply company. Out of stock. I mean, everything. I mean, Winchester, um, Remington. It's out of stock. Out of, I mean, you know. So, but you know, when you, when you go to the Lord and you want something of God, you're not going to go there and God's going to say, listen, I'm sorry, child, I'm out of stock of that. <laughs> You're going to have to come back later on because we're going to have to resupply. Uh, God's not out of stock of things. He's, God has never been out of stock of things. And so if you have a need this morning, which I know you do, because if you're like me, you have needs. You're, you're flesh. And as flesh and as you know, having the Adamic nature that we still have, you know, when God saved us, he saved our soul, but he didn't save our, our flesh. I wish, I wish that, I wish he had, but he had, you know, that was, we still got to carry around this, this sinful flesh. But God it has an abundant supply. Aren't you glad about that? Aren't you glad today that God has an abundant supply? He's not out of stock of things. And so I want to look at this wonderful side of, of God this morning, a wonderful side. God, listen, you know, God has, he has many different sides to himself. God is not a God of just one side. God has many sides. And uh, God is good. If you, want a, if you want a good God, you better, then you seek the God of heaven. The God of heaven is a good God. He's always been good. He's been good from the beginning. If you go to the book of Genesis and, and look there with uh, the beginning and Adam and, 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 and you look at Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and uh, everybody there. Listen, God was good to everybody. So that you have that side of God where he's a good God. Amen. If, if you're saved today, you know that you have experienced the good side of God. But then I also look in the Bible and I see also that God is a God of severity. That's what Paul said. That's not my words. That's Paul. God is a God of, of severity. Romans chapter 11 talks about the goodness of God and the severity of God. So see, God's not a one-sided God. God is good. God is the God of severity. Severity is the fact that God... Uh, comes to a point where God just, he just, he's done. He doesn't put up with it no more. And you see that in the word of God. God, uh, he lets things go on for a while and carry on for a while. And, and even today, you, we look at things and we think, man, how, I, know, I know for me, I look and I think, God, how can you let this stuff just go on? You know, how can you let, you know, people just murder uh, babies like they're doing? And how can you? How can you let, you know, uh, fornication and drugs and all these, all this, the wickedness go on? And, uh, but God, he lets these things go. But you know what? Eventually he says enough is enough. And then he brings the judgment. And so God is a God of severity. Um, God is forgiving. I mean, that's why, that's why we're here today. You know, if, if God hadn't forgiven you, you wouldn't be sitting here today, most likely. I know I wouldn't be. I, I'd be doing, I, if, I wouldn't, if I wasn't in hell, I'd be somewhere wasting my life away. But God, 40 years ago, 1979, I found the side of God of forgiveness. Forgiveness. He's a forgiving God. But then I also know this, that God... He loves judgment. The Bible says that God loves judgment. He loves, he loves to 
to bring the, the truth out, and he loves to see, you know, things executed rightly and justly, unlike what we see today in, in our world. People today, you know, they do things and they get away with a lot of things, don't they? Depending on who you know, what you know, how much money you have, and all these things. But, you know, you, you can't buy, God can't be bought. And when men stand before God, uh, God's not going to be bought off to like, you know, okay, I, go ahead, you go through. Uh, God, is, God loves judgment. And that's, that's found in the book of Psalms. Psalms 37, 5, Psalm 33, or Psalm 33, 5, Psalm 37, 28. The Bible says God loves judgment. And, uh, you know, I also see in the Bible that God, he can repent. God can repent. Not, not that he has to repent of some, 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 you know, transgression or whatnot. God repents in that he changes his mind. You know, you, you can change the mind of God. We can change the mind of God if we if we would change our life. And God, God can, will repent of things. I find that in the book of Jonah. Mem Nineveh, remember Nineveh, how Nineveh was doing wickedly before God and, and Jonah preached and Nineveh got right uh, to the, you know, and Jonah didn't want it, but they did. And when Nineveh got right, the Bible says that God repented of the evil that he thought to do unto them. So God can, God can repent. But I also know that God, in Romans chapter 1, that God will also give somebody up. If you look at the book of Romans, God gave somebody up. What did God give them up to? God gave them up to uncleanness. Because they, they just didn't want to, they didn't want to come out of that sinful life. You know, all the preaching, all the, uh, all, all the Holy Spirit uh, calling and all the witnessing and all these things, uh, people just don't want to leave that life of sin and, and uncleanness. And so what does God do? Well, the Bible says that God gives them up. God says, okay, that's what you want to do. Just, if you won't listen to me, if you won't, won't listen to truth, I'm giving you up. That's not, what, that's not God's choice, but that's what God does. God gives them up. Not only does he give them up, but I also see there in Romans chapter 1 that God will give them over. He gives them up, and he, but he also gives them over. And the Bible says he gives them over to a reprobate mind. He says, okay, this is how you want to think. Is this, is, this, is this the thoughts that you want? Then you can have at it. That's what God does. He gives people over to a reprobate mind. You know, people's, t people's thinking today, I mean, if you, just listen, if you just listen to what people are saying out there, people's thinking today, for the most part, is all wrong. The only, listen, the only way you can get your thinking correct is if you spend time in the Word of God. That's it. If you don't spend time in that book, your thinking is going to be wrong. Because your thinking has to be based on the truth of God. And so people's thinking today is all wrong. Matter of fact, I go back in Genesis uh, chapter 6 there about Noah. The Bible says that the imagination of the thoughts of their heart were only evil continually. I mean, their thinking was messed up. Their thinking, their thinking was based on a heart condition, their heart condition. Well, we know what Jeremiah 17 says about the heart, don't we? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You can't, you can't base your, your thinking on a, on a wicked and dirty heart. But people do. So, uh, you know, I, I, I see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 where it says that God will send people strong delusions. 
God will send strong delusions to do what? To believe. The Bible says to believe a lie. You see, God will send a delusion that people will believe a lie? Absolutely. That's the word of God. But you have to understand why God, God does that. If you go back up to the verse just above it, you see why God sends strong delusions that men might believe a lie. Because they love not the truth. That's why God does it. See, God just doesn't, God just doesn't do something because he got nothing else to do. People don't love the truth. That what? That they might be saved. And so that's, that's kind of where we're at today, isn't it? Where people don't love the truth. And listen, if you don't love the truth and have no desire for truth, you won't be saved. Because, because the truth is right here before us in the word of God. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by him. People hear that and they think, they say, no, that's no. You can get to heaven many ways. You can get to heaven through different avenues. No, you can't. No, you can't. And if you, listen, if you believe that, if you believe that you can get to heaven without Christ, Jesus, listen, you are believing a lie. You're, 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 del, you're under strong delusion. But having said all that, I want to look at a truly great verse in the Bible. That, that was kind of my introduction. Uh, but I want you to turn with me this morning to Ephesians chapter number 3, if you would. Ephesians chapter number 3. I remember, I remember I, I was a teenager, I, got, I just got saved, and I lived right close to the high school that I uh, grew up by, I grew up by a high school, a uh, big high school, and uh, I remember I came home one day, I, just got, I was just, had just got saved, not long, and I came home one day and I crossed the parking lot there, church, it was a church parking lot, I crossed it there, and there was a book in the, in the, in the ground, in the, in the mud, and I didn't know what it was, but the Spirit of God said to me, pick it up, it's the Bible. That's what the Spirit of God told me. And I went, I went over there, picked up, the, picked up the book, and it was the Bible. And, you know, I, th I think about that, and I thought about that over, you know, my Christian life, and, and it just... You know, it, it just affirms to me that God, now that you're saved, you know, God speaks to us. He speaks to our heart. I mean, not audibly. I mean, you know, we don't have, but he speaks to our heart. And um, so in Ephesians uh, chapter number three and verse number 20, which is a great verse in, in our Bibles, It says, now, now unto him, talking about God, God the Father, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly. I want you to draw your attention to those two, two things, the words. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly. God just doesn't, he, he's not just able to do something for you. God is able to, to do something for you that nobody else can do for you. You understand what I'm saying? When you got saved, God did something for you that nobody could do for you. Not church, not a preacher, not some religious guy and in religious robes and things like that. God did for you. He did something abundantly. He, 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 um, he has an exceeding abundant supply. He is able to do ab 
exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or even think. Even think. You can't, in other words, what I think what Paul said, you can't, for the most part, if the Spirit of God does not help you see these things, you will not see these things. God can do something for you that, I mean, that, I mean, you may ask God to do things, and God will do it, but God will do things for you that you may not even comprehend, ask or think. Ask or think. And the truth is, God has done for us things that even probably today, I know God has done things for me, and I know for you, that even today we probably don't even understand or can't even comprehend the fact that you're sitting here today as a saved person bears witness to that truth. The fact that we are here today saved and born again and washed in the blood and we've been to the cross and we've believed on Jesus Christ that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Listen, you know what that is? That is amazing. It's amazing. And that's why that hymn writer wrote, I stand amazed. In his presence. I stand amazed. I, listen, I, I stand amazed. Every day, every day that I wake up and go through this life, you know what, there's times that just things just hit me. And I think to myself, I'm, I'm amazed. Why God would love me? Because listen, I don't know about you, but I know me. I know me. I know something about me that, and, and you know something about you, but I know something about me that, you know what? I am not worthy. I am, un, I am, I am unlovable. I am un, I, and I don't understand why God would love me, but that's the love of God. Amen. It's amazing. It's amazing. But then, but then I mean, that's all a great thought there, but then the, the Spirit of God just kind of tacks a little bit onto that wonderful verse there. It says there, According, according to the power that worketh in us. You know, as a child of God, you have something in you that you really, it, it, I don't know if we can even comprehend it all. You have, you have, the Bible says that you have a power in you that God has given you. I, no, I didn't give, nobody gave it to you. No, no flesh, no man, no preacher gave it to you. Listen, your dad didn't give it to you. I know Brother Wynn has a, a, a missionary pastor dad, and he's a great guy. But you know what? He didn't give his son what he has. I mean, he brought him up in the Christian faith, but God gave him what he has. God gave him the power of God in his life to be able to do what? To believe that that with God all things are possible. Amen. When Brother Wynn goes out there in Mexico and knocks on doors, he's not going out there in the power of his dad. He's going out there in the power of God because he believes that God can do some things. And God, God, God can do some things. And, and that power of God that's inside you, it tells you, it te when you do something for God, it tells you along the way, it says, listen, God can do it. God can do it. God can save souls. God can work on hearts. God can chip away at the stony heart of men. Tells you that. Amen, brother? Tells you that. You get ready to do something, and God says to you, I know you're going out some, but I'm going to let you know that when you go out there and you go out there and witness for me, I'm going to help you. I'm going to, I'm going to give you the words to say. But not only am I going to give you the words to say, I'm going to convict the heart of the one that you're speaking to that they might see the truth. And what happens? God gloriously saves the sinner. That's what I'm talking about this morning. I'm talking about an amazing thing. And I'm talking about that God can do something. He's an, ab an abundant supplier. He's an abundant supplier. 
You know, one of my favorite, one of my favorite messages of all time, I mean, I, I listen to it all, as much as I can. I just love the message. It was a message I listened to like way, way back. It was a message that was preached by a, a man of God, and his name was called uh, Harold Zeitler. I don't know if you know Harold Zeitler. He's a southern preacher down, down south. He may, he may be retired right now. But he preached a message in his home church, and he was actually on the radio when he preached it, and he didn't even realize it at the time. And, and, uh, and his message that he preached was out of Psalm chapter 78, verse 19. And his title was, Can God? Can God? Anybody ever heard that message, Can God? Oh, let me tell you something. Get, 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 go on to YouTube or wherever you got to go. Get, but listen to that message. It, it will uh, stir you up. And his message was, can God? And he, he based it on that verse in Psalm where when Israel had gone out into the wilderness after they had come out of Egypt and they had gone out there and had began the, their wilderness journey. And, uh, you know, you know for what, as Christians, you know what we're, we're like? We're like Israel. We are in a wilderness journey. Aren't we? Isn't it, isn't it kind of kind of exciting how you, how you look at the Bible and you see what what God did there, and you think you know what God did there? He's, he's kind of doing that with me. That's because you know God deals with men pretty much the same because men men are the same, basically. And God brought Israel out of Egypt. God brought you and I out of a world of sin and. You know, the world, really the world, or Egypt is the type of the world in the Bible. And God brings us out and brings us into a wilderness journey because this world is not our home. We're just pilgrims, amen. It's not our home. You know, we hear, we, I get all, I, listen, I, listen, I get all worked up about all this stuff. I hate to admit it, I do. I get worked up. I see all the stuff going on in the news media today, and it works me up so bad. I tell you, I just got to get a hold of myself. The Spirit of God says, get a hold of yourself, son. Slap me around. You're not of this world. <laughs> I'm taking you out of this thing. And, you know, God brings me back to my senses. Um, because, you know, the Word of God says that, that in the last days, it doesn't say good things are going to happen. It doesn't say America's going to be great again. It doesn't say that. I, I, I mean, you know, I love my country, but it doesn't say make America great again in the last days. You know, save America. I mean, you know what it says? Perilous times will come. So I say that, just keep you on your toes because, you know, uh, listen, I, I, I like Trump rallies as much as everybody else does, but you know what? I, I, also, I, I love the Bible. I, I love the word of God. And uh, anyways, but Israel got out there in, in the wilderness, and rather than trusting God, they, they began to complain. They began to, they began to harden their heart to God, toward God. And you know, the word of God says in Hebrews 3, verse, tw verse 12, and you can look at it there when you get a chance, but it says there that we need to be careful that we don't let an evil heart of unbelief in our life that will keep us from living for God, that would make us depart from the, from the living God. I and mean, that's the warning. That's the warning in Hebrews. So be careful about that. But, but God, God is a, uh, God's, God's an amazing God. And, um, and I, I just want to, I want to say that God will take care of you. God will take care of you. For the simple fact this morning that God, that God can and is able to take care of you. You see, God could have took care of Israel easily and, and did. But they got out in the wilderness and said, can God? And Brother Zeitler in his preaching, that message, I, he went on to preach that God can. I, Israel was saying, can God? And God was saying, I can. I can. God can take care of you. You see, because what we have, what we have in the Lord 
is a never-ending supply of strength and things that God would, would want us to have. All we have to do this morning is we've got to get plugged in. We've got to get plugged in. You know, I got a lamp in my office there, and it's, it's there, but you know what? It's not plugged in. I just got it there in case I need it. But that's, you know, but it, it, it doesn't do me any good if it's not plugged in. If I need light, I got, it's got to be plugged in. And so we got to get plugged in to, to the Lord. And we got to get plugged into God's power source so we can get the job done. And I want to encourage you to, to do that. Because the time is, time is running out. It's time to get plugged in to that abundant supply that God has for us. You know, I just want to give you a couple. i got about five minutes left. So I want to just give you a couple of thoughts here. What, what kind of abundant supply does God have? Well, first of all, God has an abundant supply of grace. Of grace. I mean, if, if we didn't believe that, then why would we call this church Grace Baptist? I bet, I bet, I bet when Brother Nice was, was uh, I guess he started the church or came very soon, I mean, but why would you want to pastor church if, you didn't, if they didn't believe in the grace of God? God has an abundant supply of grace. Grace. And you know, you know what God tells us to do? Have a little bit of grace. That's kind of hard, though, you know. It's hard when, especially when you've got a bunch of uh, pride in your life because you, don't, you, know, you, you think that, well, if that brother did something, uh, you know, I, he shouldn't have done that, and you kind of look at him as something maybe lesser than yourself. But uh, we got to have grace. Paul, Paul said, listen, you got to have grace. you got to have grace. you got to have grace. And there was a lot of people in the Word of God that you, that, that you read where they didn't have grace with Paul. They wanted grace from Paul, but they didn't, they didn't want to give grace to Paul. Okay? But God, God has an abundant supply of grace. Romans chapter 5 says, More, Moreover, the law entered that the offenses might abound. You see, the law, the law was good. There's nothing bad about the law. The problem with the law was us. <laughs> we, couldn't, we couldn't keep it. <laughs> Men couldn't keep the law because they had a fallen nature. But the, the, Paul said, listen, the, the law was good. The law is holy. There's nothing wrong with that. But the law entered that the offenses might abound. The law, what the law did was it put light on the, the, the sin. It put light on the adultery. It put light on the, the thievery or the covetousness. Or, or these things. It put light on it. But I, but I love the rest of that verse. Because it says, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. What, what, a, what a great way to finish off that verse, eh? The law, the, the law was to show our sin, but you know what? There was a thing of grace there. And where, where, where sin abounded, where, where sin, grace did much more abound. You say, preacher, you don't know what I've done. Listen, I know there's people out there all over Bridgeport. I got no doubt about it. There's people all over Clarksburg. There's people all over Fairmont. People all over Marion County, Taylor County. You know, and it's, it's a sad thing because they think that they have done some sin that they can never be forgiven of. And they've just given up. They say, listen, I'm, I, I, I'm just going to live my life out and be, be uh, under guilt and shame for something I've done, whether it's maybe some, maybe some unfaithfulness that they've done or 
maybe they've taken some, something that wasn't theirs, and which is all sin. It's all bad. And uh, but I, but we need to we need to echo the message of the Word of God that we're we're sin about. Grace did much more abound. They can be forgiven. They can be cleansed. They can be redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that is our message. And if, that's, if you don't have that message, then you don't have a message. There's an abundant supply of God's grace. You know, what, you know what grace is? It's simply this, unmerited favor. You know, when God gave me his grace, and I had the grace of God, if I'm saved, I had the grace of God, because without it, you can't be saved. For by grace are you, what? Saved. That is Bible salvation. That is New Testament salvation. For by grace are you saved. It's the grace of God. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works. Lest any man should boast. God gave us unmerited favor. In other words, God looked at us and said, you know what? You are as guilty, you are as guilty as guilty could be. You are as sinful as sinful can be. He said, but you know what? I'm going to have grace. I'm going to forgive you. And I have an abundant supply of forgiveness. You know, I met, I met that God. My wife met that God. I was a, I was a teenager that was, I was as, as ungodly, and I was as, as unclean. I was as lost. I was hell bound. I knew it. But God came to me one day in 1979. I think it was around June, June 20th. And I had a knock on my door one day. Opened the door up, and it was the pastor's son. Uh, his name was Jimmy, Jimmy Whitman. He, he had just come back from Howells Anderson College on, on um, a school break. He, was, he, was, he came back to the church in, in Latham, where I was, from, from Howells Anderson, and he came back there on school break to Howells Anderson. And God said, I want you to go across the street. Because we knew each other. We grew, up, we grew up with each other. And God said, I want you to go across the street, and I want you to witness to, well, actually, he, he was going to witness to my stepdad. And he came over, and we sat down around the table. He began to witness to us. My stepdad got up off, uh, up off the chair and left the room. So now here, Jimmy and, and myself, we're one to one talking about, and Jimmy began to witness to me, and he began to tell me about how to be saved and the need to be, but you know what God began dealing with my heart as a lost teenager. I was miserable. I said, I said to myself that day, I said, listen, I tried this, I tried that, I tried this, I tried that, I did this, this I've done it all. What, what was I looking for? I was looking for something real. But I didn't find it. I said, you know, I said to myself that day, you know what, I think God's got something for me here. So him and I went, and we knelt down at my bedside, and I asked, I asked the Lord to save me that day. And I tell you, what a glorious salvation it was. I got up off my knees, and I said, <laughs> I said you know what, I feel clean. I feel clean. I've, I've never felt clean a day in my life, but I felt clean that day. He said, what happened? I got a hold of the grace of God. I got a hold of abundant grace. I got a hold of a grace that was greater than all my sin. And that's the message today. And it's a great message. And uh, we're probably all saved today and thank God for that. But I want you to go this morning and go back to your homes and, and just, you know what, rejoicing in the grace of God in your life today. Because it's an amazing thing. Amen. Amazing. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the day. We thank you, God, for allowing us to be together.
to open up the word of God. I pray that you bless the preaching and everything that was said this day. God, be with those that, once again, that those that could not make it. I pray that the online service that Pastor Vine would do would be a blessing and encouragement. Help the preacher, Lord, as he does the service online. I pray that the Spirit of God would take the words and, and aim it at the hearts of those, Lord, that uh, would listen today as they take time to listen to the preaching and the Word of God. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thank you.